helped me and I got to go back to Vietnam and I spent my re the remainder of my tour in Vietnam and then they were going to retire me. Uh, I convinced General Westmoreland that well if I can spend four months in Vietnam uh, surely I can, I had 18 months left on my original tour of duty, surely I can do 18 months stateside. And he said well okay but in letting, instead of letting me be a regular soldier, he put me on the speaking circuit. Now this was 1968, 69 time frame, and my job was to go talk to the colleges and universities. Wow. Uh, and he, he gave me intense orders that I was not to respond to the audience, that I was to stand up in my best military fashion and read the speech that had been prepared for me by General Westmoreland, well actually it wasn't him I'm sure, but it was just a one page speech and basically it was telling the kids just about everything they didn't want to hear. But that was my job. And That's pretty intense. And how many, you did that for 18, 18 months. months? Yes sir, 18 wow. months. Trying to convince myself not to just jump on them and uh, do what I wanted. Uh, when I hit the ground my well, foot hit the ground, the one young lady came up to me and she goes, Sergeant Davis, and I said, yes, ma'am. She said, we're here to let you know that we understand the difference between the war and the warrior. And we're here protesting the war. Right. And then he turned around and walked away. Well, it took me a minute for it to fully absorb, you know, the impact of what that had, but that made the rest of my a speaking tours somewhat easier because then I realized that perhaps all of them were not there protesting the warrior, which was me, yeah. that they were there protesting a war. And that's their right. right. That, that I, I would hope that they would be educated in doing that, but that is their right. That's the right that the warriors fought for, to give them that right, right. to protest. Well, it sounds, it sounds about as it intense without hearing the story of actual combat it seems it sounds like it has a, a kind of rough edge to it, a lot of it I learned a lot of lessons in that 18 month speaking tour all across America because up till that point I had everything that I wanted to happen all I had to do was to run faster jump farther endure more pain or whatever you know just don't quit as long as you don't quit, you don't lose. And that didn't apply in speaking to the college kids. So I had to learn a whole new set of rules. And I think in General Westmoreland's wisdom, he understood what I had been through and knew that I need to, needed to grasp a whole new set of rules. Patience, understanding, you know, kindness. And by the time I completed uh, they retired me in September of 69. Uh, I was a better person for having talked to millions of young hippies protesting the war. That's an incredible story. You know, I think we might come back to it. But I'd like stories. We're just keeping this thing from moving, and now we're ready. Okay. Now, Sammy, if you could tell me, just to start off, for the editor, your name and, and rank and... At, background. at the time that I earned the medal? At or the time to, you earned, earned the medal. My name is Sammy L. Davis. I was a private first class in the artillery, 2nd Battalion, 4th Artillery, 9th Infantry Division, Vietnam. Can you tell me a little bit about your personal background, uh, where you're from, your family? Yes, sir. I was born in Dayton, Ohio, November the 1st, 1946. My mother and father had met at Fort, no, not Fort Bliss, Texas, Air Force Base in Northern Texas uh, in 1945, right near the end of the war. Uh, Dad was, uh, they had made him a truck driver and they stopped at, at this fort and my mama just so happened was going to California with her mother. They were going out to visit relation and mom and dad run into one another and they said, this is it and they got married, and I was born in Dayton, Ohio. Well, my dad worked in the oil field uh, until 1957. In 1957, the oil field collapsed in Illinois, which was where we were living. Uh, so as a driller, uh, 
dad said, well, I don't know what else I can do, but he went to work for Brown and Root. Uh, and that's when the new cracking units in petroleum refinery, uh, which now it's old knowledge, but at that time it was, that's when they were just coming up with the new uh, catalytic cracking units that they were adding to the existing refineries. And dad's knowledge of crude and what you're supposed to do with it uh, got him a job. So we traveled all over the United States. We're basically, wherever there's a refinery, we live for about four months. Uh, so we got to see a lot of the country. Now the downside of that was that I would go to school and be there three months or four months, depended on how big that particular job was, and then would move. I went to as many as three schools in one year. So I'd make new friends and then I'd leave and you know go to a whole new state. And at the time I thought, well, this is really terrible. You know, I just, I'm never gonna have any friends. But now, wherever I go, I'm going home. And I've got schoolmates, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, now, did you have siblings, or you? Did yes, sir. I definitely had siblings. I uh, had three older brothers and one younger brother and two younger sisters. Uh, all my brothers have passed away. Uh, the older one, the older brothers were all veterans, and I won't say they died of wounds that received in their particular combat. My oldest brother was in Korea. Uh, next oldest brother was in the Berlin crisis in 1961. Uh, so did you grow up uh, thinking of the military as a career for you? And was that? Uh... I always wanted to join the Navy because my oldest brother was in the Navy. And at this time period, we were living in California, Stockton, just south of Stockton, California, and I joined the Sea Scouts when I was about 12 or 13 years old and was in the Sea Scouts up until the time when we moved to Indiana, which was uh, between my junior and senior years of high school. Uh, Dad got a job in Indiana, so we moved to Indiana. Uh, I graduated in 1966 in Mooresville. We lived in Waverly, which is a real small town. Uh, my two younger sisters and my young youngest brother was still at home. We were all kids together. Um, I joined the service right out of high school. In fact, just within days after uh, I graduated, I went down and joined up, and they said, well, you can't come in until September 28th. So I went to work in the oil field, and I worked in the oil field all summer in Illinois, and then went back in, and they took me away. Now you were going, did you enlist in the army or or the navy? Then? I enlisted in the army, uh, in Indianapolis on September. Or excuse me, it was about June, the first week of June. Uh, went in to go into the navy, and the line was shorter in the army, so I joined the army. That's how I got Army. <laughs> now, was your next oldest brother already uh, in, the, in the military at that point? He was in the Air Force. Uh, neither one of them, all, all three of my older brothers just spent their three, they all joined. I mean, they were volunteer, they spent three years. Uh, my youngest brother, uh, which was 10 years younger than I, uh, never had the opportunity to go into the any of the military. Uh, he was killed in a car accident when he was 21. And it always seemed rather ironic that I earned my medal on September, or excuse me, November the 18th, 1967. I turned 21 on November the 1st. And my little brother turned 21. His birthday was September 26th. And he was killed on September 29th, just a couple days after he turned 21, and I always thought it was kind of strange that now here I was the one that probably was supposed to, you know, die, and it was my little brother. So didn't think that was quite fair. Left he left two boys and a wife. And That's rough. And uh, well, clearly when you were signing up uh, for the military, uh, Vietnam was very much a factor. 
you knew is... Yes, sir. In 1966, uh, we couldn't find it in our school books because in 1966 it was still called Indochina, French Indochina. So when Vietnam was in the news, uh, naturally we were concerned about it, so we went to the history books and the encyclopedias or wherever we could find maps of, of Asia, there was no Vietnam. So we didn't know where it was for sure. Uh, one of the things that motivated me to join right out of high school was Roger Donlan, Medal of Honor recipient. Roger Donlan. He had just received his medal. And Roger Donlan, I thought, was probably one of the bravest men in the whole world. And I'd like to go do my job like he did his job. Now, Roger, can you, did you actually, how, how did you find out about him? Did you oh, he was on the news, seen him on the news when they were presenting the Medal of Honor to him. Seen him on the news. I, no, I did not know Roger then. Can you tell me the story of actually seeing that and what it meant to you at that moment? I was working at a bowling alley. I was I ran the restaurant at a bowling alley and we had a television and I worked from four in the evening till midnight, six nights a week, after right after school. Uh, so I while the people were bowling, well, you didn't have a lot to do. You know, you bake the pies and the hamburgers and have everything all ready. Uh, so I got to look at the TV and there came Roger Donlin on and he just you know standing so tall and so straight and showed the president it was a very short clip about a four second clip of the president putting the Medal of Honor on Roger Donlin's neck now I, because of the military people in my family I was very aware of what the Medal of Honor was and I thought wow you know when I grow up I'd like to be a soldier like him wow, that's impressive. you don't <laughs> lose till you quit trying now, can you tell me, by the way, is the door, does the door need to be closed? Let me just... I, I thought it was closed. No, sir. My father's name is Robert Houston Davis. Oh, so you're not a junior. My mama's daddy was Samuel Balmer from, oh. from Peoria, Illinois. And when I was born, mama thought that I didn't look like a Samuel, so she just named me Sammy. Yeah. My oldest son has so, so. <coughs> like Sammy. Excellent. November 1st. No, that's his birthday yeah. also? Yeah. I got to meet this young man. Yeah, he's uh, 85, so he's 18. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So Most just excellent. Finishing high school. Two Sams born on November the 1st. Right. Um, okay, so take me back to your enlisting and the early stages, boot camp. What did you, what was your process after, after yes, sir. enlisting? After graduating from high school, I went down and joined the Army. And they told me that, well, you will report for duty on September 28th here in Indianapolis, then we will ship you to your basic training outfit. I said, okay. So I got a job in the oil field in Illinois and worked the whole summer uh, wrenching rods. And y'all probably don't know what that is, but it's, it's very physical. Uh, when I went into basic training, I was in better physical shape than when I came out. That's how rough a job, rod wrenching, you're pulling the wells and undoing the, the rods and the tubing that everything goes down in a hole. Uh, so it's a lot of upper body strength. Uh, I was in better shape when I went into basic training. In fact, I gained 22 pounds in basic training. Uh, so we went into, I see, where did I go in at? Um, Little Korea. Fort Lost in the Woods in Missouri. What's the name of that fort? My mind's a blank at the moment. Uh, there was such an influx of people coming into the military during that time period that they didn't have any room in their basic training unit. So they put us on buses and took us to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. There was uh, about 400 of us that they shipped down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And we were putting a B-62, best on the hill, sir. Uh, and that's where we did basic training. Uh, had a drill, our, my drill sergeant was Sans, uh, see, Sergeant Francisco Quinones. And I just knew he hated me. Uh, come to find out he didn't hate me. 
but I thought he did because he picked on me all the time. When I graduated from basic training, he said, the reason why I have been more rough on you than some of the other young men is it because I saw more potential in you and I wanted you to know what you could do. Um, so I thank Sergeant Francisco Quinones. He, he was one of the first people in the military that made me realize that truly you don't lose until you quit trying. All you gotta do is just never quit trying. After basic training, we went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, it was in Foxtrot 3, F3 training uh, battalion. Uh, learned to be an artilleryman. Uh, got out of that in um, let's see in February and had a leave. And then I w reported to back to Indianapolis, where they shipped. They flew me out of Indianapolis into Vietnam uh, and arrived in Vietnam on March 3rd, 1967. Uh, that was real close to the time period when they blew up the Long Bend ammunition dump, which was the largest ammunition dump in that part of the world, maybe the whole world. It was miles and miles uh, circumference. And they pulled a hundred of us. My original orders was for the 23rd Field Artillery Group, which was right up on the DMZ. Uh, the 23rd was primarily the big heavy artillery, the 175 Long Toms. Uh, which we had trained for. But they pulled a hundred of us to be pad guards at the Long Bend ammunition dump. And we thought, wow, this is just terrible. You know, we're gonna be, we're gonna guard ammunition. Well, it turned out it was pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> you got to familiarize yourself with virtually every kind of munitions that any of the services had because at one night or another, you would have that pad to guard. Well, as Young men, you're not just going to stand there and look at it. You're going to pick it up, look at it, go, whoa, man, this is cool, isn't it? Uh, so we got to familiarize ourselves with all those different kind of munitions. Uh, we were there 63 days before they finally uh, brought in permanent people that were to be pad guards. And then they cut orders on us again, and they sent all 100 of us to 2nd Battalion, 4th Artillery, 9th Infantry Division, which was down in the Delta. So instead of going way up north, I was way down south. Um, now, the, to, to go back to this <coughs> artillery uh, storage area yes, sir. blowing up, there had there been some kind of explosion? Oh, yes, sir. Thing? The night that I arrived in country, uh, they had a terrible explosion there. Uh, sappers, sabotage people came in and started blowing pads of ammunition up. And we had 8-inch artillery projos landing in the 90th replacement compound, which was several miles away. Now they were not armed, they were just blown up. But we thought this was the way it was. I mean, you know, we're, we're in Vietnam where the war was, this way the John Wayne movies was, you know, you see all these things happening. So we're kind of standing in a little bunker and going, wow, this is about the way it is, until the sergeant came by and kicked us where it would do the most good and said, you boys get out there on the perimeter, we're getting hit. So we got our M14s and went out and and they weren't hitting us, they were just hitting the Long Bend ammunition dump. Right. So so then to go back to your story, you had been <coughs> guarding that dump for a while and then or that 63 days we were there, yes sir. A couple of months and then you were sent down south. Yes sir. To the Delta. Tell me about what you were doing down there and what, what's your sense of the overall Where we had been was? at Benoit is where the Long Bend, Long Bend area is where we had been for the first 63 days. Uh, the sergeant in charge of us there said, I don't care what you do all day. If you can go home and be back here by four o'clock, get it. But if you're not here at four o'clock, your young backside is mine. So we got to travel, you know, get on motor scooters, borrow them or beg them or whatever, uh, rent them. And we would get, got to do a lot of traveling. Now that was in the mid highlands. Uh, it's, it's very little rice paddies up there. It was in beautiful, beautiful part of Vietnam. Uh, got to meet a lot of the, the people. Uh, got to make friends with a lot of the people. And then when we were sent down to Tan Tru, Vietnam, that's way down in the Delta, right just off the Mekong River. And it's uh, the area that I fought my Vietnam in was very much like the Everglades. 
most people have a pretty good visual image of what the Everglades looks like. Well, that's where my Vietnam happened, uh, which is a whole new, a whole new set of uh, operating practices because we had been trained, you know, to move the artillery piece. You hook it up to the truck and you drive down the road. And when you get to the site where you're supposed to be, you back up. You know, there were no roads. We had to do everything by helicopter, which we had never done anything by helicopter before. And the big Chinooks would come in and pick our gun up and sling the ammunition underneath it and take us to a, a, a little island in the middle of the Everglades and drop us down. Usually there were four guns that would go out on operations. Uh, but the, you'd be very, very close together. And our job was to provide close and continuous support to the infantry. That's the artilleryman's job. So the artillerymen uh, would sometimes have to fire almost continuously for eight, eight or ten hours. As long as the enemy was attacking our infantrymen, you had to do your job. Uh, and then you may lay around for a day or two days and not do much. You, then you cleaned everything and painted everything and polished your bullets. Uh, sergeant James Gant from Lansing, Michigan, he was the meanest sergeant I've ever seen in my life. And he would make us take each bullet out of our clip every night before it got dark and polish it. And we just knew that he was just a bitter old man. And that's the only reason why he was making us do this. Now, it wasn't until later that we found out that because of Sergeant Gant's experience, the M16 had a problem jamming in the early, early years. And his answer was to keep the bullets clean. But he didn't tell us that. He was, he was old. I would think Sergeant Gant was 27 years old. You know, he was, he was just a bitter old sergeant, and that's why he was picking on us. Uh, I wish that he would have taken the time to explain maybe just a little bit more why we had to have clean bullets. But it worked out okay, because we, we scared death of him. He, he was a mean old sergeant. Uh, <laughs> next question. Right, so you were, um, you would be flown out, and would you return <coughs> back to a given spot, or did you stay out in... Um, Tantru or... Tantru was our base camp. Okay. That's where our battery based at. And then we would work out of that. Uh, we always left at least two guns back to guard the home. And then we would take guns out on different operations all over. Uh, we even went up into the highlands, you know, depending if it was a really big operation and they were shy of artillery, they'd come down and borrow two guns and the crew from us, and then we would join the 173rd Airborne Brigade or the 25th or the 1st Cav and be with them for a week or 10 days, and then they'd send us back to Tantru again. Uh, we kept very busy. So this is already the summer or so uh, of 67. Yes, sir. And you were actually, the, the action for which you were honored was in November. Yes, sir. Can you tell me the lead up to that? What was what was your unit, was it continuing the same sort of support? Maybe I should change tape before we get into this yeah. story. All right. So I can stand up? Yeah. Oh, watch the mic. Yes, sir. Uh, it's 520. Right? It's 515. It is 520 now? My watch is yeah, going 515, But we want to be done before 6. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's when. Okay, so talk to me a little bit about the lead up to the actual action yes, sir. for which you were on. I mean, uh, had, had you seen uh, a lot of. Um, well, getting hit. Action? Getting hit to us meant a few more rounds maybe some automatic weapons. Uh, very seldom did we see the enemy, or at least long enough to shoot at them, because we were artillery. Now, by this point, we had learned the fact that if the enemy was going to seriously mess with the infantry, they would take out the artillery first. So the infantry could always judge how bad they were going to get hit by how bad we got hit. Uh, on the night of November the 18th, 1967, uh, they had picked four guns up at, well, actually they picked us up about 6.30 in the morning, and they dropped us off at almost 8 o'clock on a little island just off the Mekong River down by Kaile, Vietnam. Uh, there again, the train was very much like the Everglades. Uh, we immediately set up uh, already. Before we even got the guns on the ground, the infantry was getting hit. So they needed our help. 
The reason why you had to move often as artillerymen because the infantry moved and you had to stay with it. We could, we could shoot a certain distance and that's how far that we could shoot, which was seven miles. So you had to constantly be positioned and they would always try to position you where you could help the most units out. So, you know, they had hopscotch you around. We'd move three or four times a day sometimes. So we landed at eight o'clock in the morning. As soon as we spread the trails on the 105 howitzer, we started firing and we fired the weapon all day virtually as quickly as they could bring the ammunition in by helicopter and then they'd set it down, we'd start breaking it out and loading it and firing it. I mean just, it was a charge five, I remember it very well. Uh, just as quickly as we could fire, we fired all day. Just before dark, uh, the enemy broke contact, so therefore we were able to quit firing. Uh, the, I can remember the sun you look and see just about half of the sun, uh, brilliant gold with some big black color. I mean, it was the sunsets and sunrises over there were just awesome. And I can remember looking up, you know, this, you know, you're just so exhausted, so hot, so tired, but you look up and you see that sunset and it just kind of made you feel a little bit better. We hadn't been doing nothing for more than just five minutes and a helicopter, one of our helicopters came in and sat down and a major got out and he gathered us. Uh, there were, I believe, 42 artillerymen on this little atoll. And he said, your, pro your probability of getting hit tonight is 100%. So prepare yourselves. He got back in his helicopter and away he went. Well, as a private, I was at the very end. That's about the, that is the lowest rank you can be in combat as a private. I have maybe the uh, the higher ranking people uh, were had been explained to it in more depth of what they thought getting hit was. But me and the other privates, we said, well, getting hit. You know, we're probably going to get some mortar rounds, going to get some automatic weapons. Yeah, no big. You know, we've been shot at before. It ain't that bad. So Sergeant Gant came by and inspected our clips, make sure that every bullet in every clip was polished, and mine were, so I was squared away. Uh, we were still firing harassment and interdiction, interdiction rounds, which is we called H&Is. And what you would do to let the enemy know that we were still awake, you would fire H&Is. Just let them know that we're there. Uh, known grid coordinates of where enemies uh, were, and we would fire rounds into that all night at no set time. I mean, it wasn't done on the hour, on the half hour. It was just, you'd get up and fire. But we weren't really firing the weapon like we had all day. Uh, we were working two hours on, two hours off. Uh, supposedly, you could sleep the other two hours, but it was hot and the skeeters were terrible. Uh, you were so tired you couldn't sleep. Have you ever been that tired? Uh, a lot of things going through your mind at about quarter till two in the morning. Uh, Marvin Hart, one of my, there were four of us on the gun. Actually, there were only three of us. Sergeant Gant was the fourth one, and he was a mean old soldier. Uh, there were three kids on his gun. Uh, Marvin Hart came over and said, Dave, either relieve me or set up with me because I'm afraid I'm going to go to sleep. Well, I couldn't sleep anyway, so I got up. And the first thing I did was I lit a sandbag. That's back when the sandbags were cloth. And put it in a canister, one of the 105 canisters that had been fired. And you put that sandbag down in it. And what it does, it doesn't burn. It just smolders like a smudge pot. And it chases away the mosquitoes. And it creates enough heat. A sea rat can, you never cut your lit, lids all the way off. You left them just enough so you can crimp it. And you got rice paddy water and set down the edge of that canister and in about 20 minutes you'd have warm water for coffee delicious instant coffee uh, so that's what I did you know and then I kind of squatted on my haunches and talking to Marvin Hart from Oscoda Michigan and at two o'clock exactly and I remember because I looked at my watch we heard mortars sliding down the tube, which is a very distinctive sound. And to hear them sliding down the tube, you got to be pretty close. And I said immediately, I said, well, when did we move in mortars? And Hart said, we didn't. They had set up mortars. We were set up right on a small river, uh, which was just off the Mekong River. We was about 300 yards from the Mekong River on this 
at Back Canal, I think that's the name of it. Uh, the canal was about 30 meters wide, and they had set up the mortars on the just immediately on the other side, uh, and the mortars started raining down on us. Now, normally, a mortar attack for us was three to five rounds. They just wanted to keep you awake. If they keep you awake long enough, you get really tired. When you get really tired, you make poor decisions. And that's what we thought that they had been trying to do. Well, when the mortar attack continued on after the traditional three to five rounds, uh, you know, we thought, well, this is going to get serious. Well, it just the mortars were just raining down. And at 2.30 exactly, the mortars quit. And from all the, the din of them going, going off, when they quit and this silence, now because of all the mortars blowing up, when it hit that silent period, none of the birds or frogs or things that make noise in the night, they weren't doing nothing because they were scared too. So that when I say it was quiet, it was this eerie, eerie quiet. And Hart and I and Delbert Cole from, where was Cole from? He was from Texas. We looked at each other and we heard whistles being blown like a coach has. And then we heard bugles, which their charge sounds very similar to our charge, and orders being shouted in English. And basically what they were saying was, go kill the GI. Sergeant Gant said, okay, boys, this is it. So we grabbed a beehive round, set it on muzzle action, loaded it in the tube, and we were standing there at our position ready for them. Well, we could not fire the beehive. Y'all don't know what a beehive round is. A beehive round effectively turns the 105 howitzer into a shotgun. It fires 18,000 little darts, beehive darts. Uh, they're about the diameter of a pencil lead, about an inch and a quarter, inch and an eighth long, and got little fins. They look like a little arrow made out of spring steel. And that's called, we called it beehive because of the sound that it makes. Flechette round is what I think the military called it. Uh, if you've ever stood next to a beehive when the bees are buzzing and you can hear that zzzz, well, because you can't see the beehive round when it's fired, all you hear is this buzzing noise. And that's what the soldiers, that's why the soldiers named it beehive. Sound like you stand next to a beehive. So here we were standing on the piece, uh, the 105 howitzers, which is usually what they got out in front of the VFWs and American legions. They're not a real big gun. Uh, they got little shields on the side that if you're an average size fellow, you can kind of hide behind them. When you're bigger than the average bear, uh, it's real hard to hide behind one of the shields, but I was trying real hard. Uh, I, you know, kind of hunkered down, the bullets were just flying, and I was waiting for Sergeant Gant to tell me to fire. Now, I knew not to fire until he said fire, no matter what was happening, and I could see the enemy all around us. They were doing mass assault waves. 150 to 250 at a time would come running at us. But we couldn't fire the beehive because we, we were not assured that all of the people over there were enemy because we still had some infantry. Fifth to the 60th infantry had been providing a portion of our security and we couldn't fire in, at our boys. So we were trying to coordinate everything, you know, in seconds trying to get all the jobs done. Well, I heard Sergeant Gant had the headset on, on one ear, and I actually heard our fire direction control say fire before Sergeant Gant said fire, and I almost pulled the lanyard, the trigger that pulled that fire as a hat. But I knew <laughs> that although I knew he was gonna say fire, you don't fire before Sergeant Gant said fire. So, boy, I'm, then he said fire, and I pulled the lanyard. Well, the weapon went off, did its job, but there, the enemy had set up a RPG, a rocket, across the right across the river from me. And when I fired it, they fired at my muzzle blast. But instead of hitting the muzzle, they hit the shield that I was hiding behind. The round went, I was had to hold the lanyard here, which is what fires the piece, and the round went right between me and my arm. When it hit the shield, it blew up. And I got just thousands of little bitty pieces of steel all over my right side. Uh, the guy said it looked like a, uh, I looked like hamburger. Uh, which is, they, they left me for dead because they thought I was dead. It blew me off the piece. It also hit Sergeant Gant right in the chest. So the, I pulled the lanyard, and I'd, Sergeant Gant was about 
four, no, three foot from me. And the last thing I can remember was Sergeant Gant just disappearing into the darkness. Well, that's the reason why, because that rocket hit him. Blew me into my foxhole, was about, which was about eight foot away from the howitzer. And I originally it blew me, I was laying like half in and half out with my legs from my mid thigh down, was down in a foxhole, and the rest of me was up over the sandbags. Well, the enemy started turning my howitzer around, supposedly to fire, turn it and fire it at our guys. If I'd been awake, I would have known that our next gun back was going to fire a beehive round. The standing rule is you never let the enemy take control of the weapon. You know, common sense. But I was not, I was unconscious. So when the enemy started picking my howitzer up to fire it, Bill Few from Rising Sun, Ohio, fired the beehive, which saved my life. Uh, but it hit me from the mid from mid thigh up to and including my fourth lumbar vertebra. I had about 30 beehive holes that just passed through me. I had a flak jacket on, which is the only thing that saved my bat my life. Uh, when I later when I took the flak jacket off, I, I could hold it up to the light and see the beehive were sticking through. The only thing that was holding them in the flak jacket was the fins. So that's why I'd been hurting so darn bad, because all those beehive was in there working around on me. Uh, when they fired the beehive at me, it woke me up, and I rolled over, and I rolled face up in the bottom of my foxhole, and I'm looking up. Now, the foxhole just was deep enough that with the sandbags, it came, if you dug very much, dug very deep, you hit water. So it all depended on how much water you wanted to lay in, how deep you dug your foxhole. So I was laying flat. The first thing I can remember was I thought, wow, it's just like Christmas. You know, this was mid-November. You know what a tracer round is? Mm -hmm. Well, our tracers were red and their tracers were white. Sorry. Yeah, we gotta stop this. Can we just stop? It's just the no right. Yeah. Then it got real serious. My father-in-law was artillery in the Marines. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, Iwo Jima, and uh, he has some pretty amazing stories. Yeah. Iwo Jima. They're leaving. It was maids, right? It was maids, yeah. <laughs> Very vocal maids. Okay, get me the question again, and I'll try to start there again. We, sure. need, we yeah. need to back up to the point where he was face up in the. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah. So the first thing I can remember was I was laying face up in my foxhole, and I thought, well, it's just like Christmas. Now I couldn't hear nothing. You know, it was it was I was stone quiet, but I could see all these pretty lights going right over the top of my foxhole, and I guess that's what reminded me of Christmas, because our tracers are red, and their tracers were white, blue, or green, uh, depending on which communist nation was supporting that particular effort. And because they were white, blue, and green, that meant it was real well supported. So I'm, I'm laying there watching all these tracers thinking, wow, this is really cool. You know, it's really pretty. Well, my hearing went f like turning the stereo from zero to 50. You know, went from hearing nothing within just a very short period of time. It got loud enough that uh, I, my, the smoke started clearing out of my head, and I'm starting to realize what's happening. And those weren't just pretty lights. They were tracers. So I kind of raised up on one elbow. Now, my foxhole was real close to the river from, you know, three feet. So when I raised up and I looked down and there was 150 to 200 enemy right there. You know, it, well, I picked up my M16. I had 12 clips, uh, which is roughly about 180 rounds. And I started doing my job as a soldier. It reminded me of when I was a kid and dad would take us to the fair and they would have those little ducks floating in the truck, not real ducks, you know, they were little wooden ducks that you'd shoot with the Floberts and a, what was that, a little 1890 Winchester pump, you know, that shot them real low power low. And you'd sh and I can remember Dad, you know, when I was six, eight years old, all of, all of the boys, he'd line up and we'd take turns shooting those ducks and then you got a stuffed duck for a prize or something. But that's what it reminded me of, you know, that I was shooting those ducks again. Boom, 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 boom. Well, after I had cleaned out one side of what was my ammunition pouch, and I went to the other side, and it's like I hadn't even been doing nothing. I mean, there was still just, you know, just thousands of them. 
so I when I loaded the when I took the second to the last clip out and put a new clip in I started becoming concerned you know I thought well am I not doing my job am, am I not hitting my enemy you know I mean what's you know because they just kept coming I couldn't understand why they just kept coming that had never happened before I still had maybe six, eight rounds left when they quit and they fell back. So i am got a few minutes to kind of look around and see what was happening. Well, I didn't have any more ammunition. And I thought, well, I had a box of 60 M60 machine gun ammunition in my foxhole and that was 500 rounds. Artillerymen had the big box because we didn't have to carry it like the infantrymen did. Had 500 rounds in it. And I thought I remembered where another, the other box was in where the 60 was, which was the next foxhole down. So I quickly crawled over there. Sure enough, the 60 was there, another box. I drug it back to my foxhole and set it up and hadn't had it set up but a very short period of time when I could hear them screaming again. And then sure enough, here they came out of the darkness. And there again, they were 150 to 250 doing a mass assault wave at me. But I felt pretty good because I had a thousand rounds of ammunition. So I started doing my job as a soldier. Kept firing, kept firing, went through about three assault waves. And when I could see the bottom of the box, the metal box that the ammunition comes in of the last box, I started getting worried, you know, because it was just like, like living in a bad dream. You know, no matter what I did, it's like I wasn't doing nothing to them because I, I mean, I didn't realize that it was a reinforced battalion. It was 1,500 against 42 kids, 1,500 enemy against 42 kids. And they just kept coming. Well, I fired the last rounds. I had three rounds left in my 16 clip. And I was saving them. And I don't really know what for, but I was saving them for an emergency. <laughs> uh, I looked at my howitzer and it was burning all below it, virtually everything that had been on the howitzer. And that's all the little cranks and the knobs and the recoil me mechanism that's up on top of the barrel. Uh, virtually everything that had been on the howitzer was blown off, everything. Uh, tires were burning furiously. And I thought, well, maybe I can get off one round. Now, by this point, um, I'd been shot in the right thigh with an AK-47. Uh, I had the beehive in my back. Uh, had the shrapnel from the rocket round. Uh, and I didn't think that I was probably going to see daylight, but I wasn't going to quit. You know, because I thought, well, if, if, if I don't do my job, those guys behind me ain't got a chance. So I thought, well, I'll... I'll see if I can get off one round from the howitzer. So I scrounged around, found a beehive round, uh, set it on muzzle action, found uh, the canister that had not been fired, had to find the powder because we'd had everything set up nice and orderly, and naturally the mortars had blown everything askew. So I had to, it took about 20 minutes, at least 20 minutes, to find the components. Now the enemy's still doing their job. I mean, they're everywhere. I didn't have any ammunition. So I was having to hide and lay in the water and they'd run over me. And finally, when I got found all the components and I loaded the piece, well, the tube was pointing like to the left of where, that's where they originally started coming from. Well, during the course of the battle, they had moved more to the right was where I guess it was easy for them to run through. And the river was not quite as deep there. There was only a part uh, where they waded in they got almost three quarters across the river and it was still like only this deep on them. But next to my bank was deep and they had to swim the last 15, 20 foot. Um, so I had to move the piece, had to move the howitzer. Well, stateside, it takes at least four men to pick the howitzer up and rotate it on its wheels. And that's when the tires are, you know, good. And I thought, well, I got underneath the trail, put the trail across, that's the big legs that stick out behind the howitzer. Uh, got underneath it and put the trail on my shoulder and just kind of stood up and started turning it a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. I noticed big hunks of steel were disappearing off the howitzer. You know, I could feel it kind of vibrate. Now there was bullets everywhere, 
but I, it was it was mystifying why there specifically there was a big hole appeared in the in the other trail right by where my hand was and I couldn't you know the guns falling apart right in front of my face well then I realized that what it was they'd set up a 50 cal across the river and he was firing he seen me moving the howitzer and he was trying to take me out he was trying to do his job and at the end of the trails are spades like big shovels that you that put you put them in the ground and that's what keeps the howitzer from sliding backwards when you fire it so I wanted to make sure that those spades uh, had a big clump of grass or something to hold it because I didn't want it sliding over me so I was looking to see where the spades were and that's when I seen the big about a basketball sized tracer is what it looked like go and that's when I realized, well, that's why it's falling apart. They got a 50 cal on me. So when I set the tube down, I wanted to make sure that my circumference of fire would include where that 50 cal was. He was set up by a big old dead tree. It was a forked big, big old dead tree. And he was set up right beside it. So I dropped the trails and I guesstimated that, yeah, he's, he's gonna get it. Crawled underneath it. Well, uh, at that point, I had to wait a few minutes before they were doing another mass assault wave because I figured I was only going to get one round. I wanted to do as much effect as I could. Uh, heard the whistles again, here they come, and I waited until they got to the point right to where they had to start swimming again, which meant from that point all the way back for as far as you could see, there was just hundreds of them, and I pulled the lanyard. Uh, the gun didn't go off. It went, when I pulled the lanyard, it went pop, and my heart just sunk, you know, because this was my last effort. And But I could feel the gun kind of going. And then it went off, and it went boom. Well, I had overcharged it. Now, the 105 Houser has seven bags of powder in it, and they're all sold onto a string, and it's called cutting a charge. How many charges you leave in the canister determines how far you shoot. So fire direction control would say, okay, you need to shoot a charge four or charge seven or, you know, and you would cut off the bags you didn't need. Well, the battle had broken all the bags and there were just little piles of powder. Sergeant Gant had convinced us that if you want the beehive to be maximally effective, you have to fire it at maximum charge. Figured I was only going to get one round. I wanted it to be maximally effective. So I filled the canister full of loose powder. Charge seven is a maximum charge. Uh, later I was told that what I fired that night was probably equivalent to a charge 20 on a gun that didn't work. <laughs> so when it finally went off, it went up in the air, stood up straight up and fell back down. When it came back down, it landed on me. And that's broke my, crushed my ribs on the right side, broke my back, but it bounced and I rolled over. Now later, I heard the guys hollering behind me. That's how one of the, I knew that some of our guys were still alive because I could hear them hollering, yay, Dave, you know. My name's Sam, but they called me the obvious reasons. Uh, later they told me, they says, well, yeah, man, we thought that you had rigged up some kind of big flamethrower or something because of all that wet powder. That's why it didn't go off immediately. I said, yeah, it, all the time that the gun was up in the air, it was shooting flames out about 70, 75 feet. And even when it came back down, it was still spewing these pellets of fire out. You know, it was awesome. We thought you'd rigged up a big flamethrower somehow. So I'm laying back on my belly again, looking out to where the howitzer had just fired. And I could see that the beehive round had done its job. Well, I was still alive. I thought, well, maybe I can get off one more round. Well, I one more rounded it uh, until I had heard someone across the river shouting, don't shoot, I'm a GI. I had learned, we had learned earlier on in Vietnam that just because someone from obviously where the enemy is is shouting, don't shoot, I'm a GI, not to overly heed it because a lot of the Vietnamese spoke better English than us kids from Waverly, Indiana. And they would teach their soldiers to say in perfect diction, don't shoot, I'm a GI. And your natural response, especially the first few times you hear it, is to, you know, you stop what you're doing and you look. So although I had heard someone shouting, don't shoot, I'm a GI, I, I knew the direction that it was coming from, but I didn't stop and really look. Uh, 
we had a low opening illumination round. By this point, we had started getting illumination rounds from a 155 unit that was close enough or far enough away they could not fire HE, but they could fire illumination. It was just enough lighter that they could get to us, just barely could get to us. And we had a low opening round, just about treetop high. And when they pop open, it's a real loud pop. And then when the flare ignites, it's like looking into the sun. And when that happens at 75 yards away, it gets your attention. And I naturally looked at it, and I seen Gwendell Holloway, my brother, standing up waving these boonie hats saying, don't shoot, I'm a GI. I said, my God, somebody's got to go get him. I knew he was my brother. Gwendell's a black man from Stockton, California. I said, you know, somebody's got to go get him. Well, ordinarily, I'd have just run down to the river and jumped in and swam across and brought my brother back. Uh, by this point, my body was in real feeble condition, and I knew I couldn't just run down there and swim across the river. So I thought, well, I'll find an air mattress. That's what the Army had given us to sleep on uh, in the rice paddies. You know, you always end up falling off of them and getting sleeping in the water anyway, but it was a good thought. But I found an air mattress that didn't have any bullets in the portion up where the valve was, so I tied it off just about in the middle and blew it up, and sure enough, it held air. So I crawled down to the river, swam across the river, stashed the air mattress in the bushes, and started making my back, making back to where I'd last seen Gwendale standing. I was using a round bush as a, as a marker, and I kept going towards it. Now, the enemy's still doing their job. Mass assault waves running right over me. But I'd just lay there, like, by this point, there were many, many, many people laying there and I would just lay amongst them. When I finally got to the bush and I crawled around behind it, there was a foxhole there. And instead of just one man being in it, there were three men in it. <sighs> so Gwendell said, well, Jim Deister from Salina, Kansas, we, we think Jim's dead. He had been shot right through the head, had been shot in the chest. I said, we can't get a respiration or a heartbeat, and I checked him real quick, and I couldn't find nothing either. Uh, Billy Ray Crawford from Alvin, Texas. Uh, Billy Ray was, was a black man, and Billy Ray had lost his left leg from just below his knee down, but we had we tied it off. Uh, Gwendell had been shot in the back, had a shrapnel wound in his head that I could lay two fingers in, and but he was still functioning. Well, I knew I didn't have the strength to make three trips. It had taken me about 45 minutes to make that trip over to that, to that point. And I was just getting so tired. So I asked the man above to give me the strength to carry all three of my brothers at one time. I picked up Jim Deister and slid him across my shoulders, his head hanging over here and his feet here. Uh, Gwendell still had three clips of ammunition for his 16, so I put a clip in each pocket, clip in the weapon, enlarged the sling, and hung it from my forehead. Picked up Billy Ray, picked up Gwendell. Now they could both help. I mean, it wasn't like I was truly carrying all three at one time. We were really kind of all helping each other. And away we went, back towards the riverbank. We could hear when the enemy would break through the jungle and I'd lay the guys, figured I had about three seconds to cover them up with vegetation before they actually reached, ran over us. While I still had ammunition, I used the ammunition to do my job and to keep the enemy from killing my brothers. I would watch their eyes as they would run over us. And you could tell what they were thinking. Uh, most of them were just scared kids doing their job like we were trying to do, and I let them go. JC, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, so Sammy, uh, you're you're carrying or walking, getting your three guys back to the. Figured I had like three seconds to lay the guys down before they actually reached us. As long as I had ammunition left, I would I use the M16. I would lay on top of the guys face up. After I expended all the ammunition. Uh, in covering us up with vegetation, which by this point there was just all kinds of tree limbs and big tall sawgrass laying on the floor. I mean, there was lots of vegetation to cover up with, and I'd within three seconds I'd cover us up enough that we weren't extremely obvious. Uh, and I'd grabbed a hold of a tree limb. If if it was pitch dark and I handed you a baseball bat, would you know it's a baseball bat? Yeah, you probably would, because a baseball bat's got just got that feel to it. When I grabbed a hold of this limb, it just felt like a baseball bat. 
and something said, better keep that with you. So I did. The, I had three more times that I still had ammunition, but I was dragging this limb along with us too. And after I ran out of ammunition, I used the baseball bat like a club, the tree limb like a club, and it worked efficiently. Uh, made it back to the river bank, found my little piece of air mattress, uh, put Deister on it. Uh, he was the only one that couldn't hold on. So I just laid Jim across it and ferried him back to the river bank. When I got back to our side, two people jumped in the river. And I, I was trying to make up my mind what the correct, what my correct job was going to be. Was I gonna hit them? Was I gonna choke them? Was I just gonna grab a hold of them and sink to the bottom? Now this is all seconds, microseconds in your mind, you know, but I was trying to decide what to do because, man, I was just getting really tired. Face came up right in front of me, and the first thing I seen was big blue eyes. It was Bill Murray from Lenore, North Carolina, and because they had blue eyes, I knew he was one of my brothers. The other guy was Frank Gage from King of Prussia. Now, Frank's Italian, and he's got big brown eyes. The enemy had brown eyes too, and I don't know what I would have done if Frank would have came up first. I'd have probably hit him, uh, but Bill came up first, and I just kind of I passed Jim Deister on to him. They pulled Jim up on the bank and started doing what they could for him. I immediately went back across. Uh, Billy Ray and Gwendell could both hang on, so basically all I had to do was just swim. Uh, made it back to our river bank. Uh, once again, Bill and Frank jumped in the water, uh, helped get them up. We squared them away as much as with our limited resources, medical resources that we had there with us. Uh, I thought I'd better go back. I could see the tubes fly. We had two guns still functioning out of the four. I could see the barrels, the flash, and I thought, well, I'd better go help him. So I'm crawling back to help Bill Fuse gun uh, when I came across my mean old Sergeant Gant. Uh, Sergeant Gant was laying, he was about half his body depth in water, uh, had this big hole right here in his chest, had a big pile of pink foam on it. Now Sergeant Gant had taught us that that's a sucking chest wound and what you do for a sucking chest wound is, is that you get a piece of your poncho, you clean off the site, lay the chest or lay the poncho over it to seal the chest wound and then put a compress over it and that's all you can do, that you get the medic. Well, I went back to, crawled back to my original position where my duffel bag was because he said, you get a piece of your poncho. Now this is how tired you get. You know, whatever's there is what you do. I can remember laying very calmly flat on my back holding the poncho up to the illumination that was coming down, looking to see where there weren't no holes in it because it was in the duffel bag, it was all shot up. And I found a section that didn't have any holes in it, and I calmly tore it out, and crawled back up to Sergeant Gant, and uh, took his shirt off, and cleaned it off with the rice paddy water as much as I could, and I laid it down on it, and all I had was a big piece of his jacket to make a, a compress off of, but I tied that down, and almost immediately he started coughing large amounts of, of blood up and and I what I wanted him to do was just to say okay now private now here's what you're going to do next because this was my sergeant this was the mean old sergeant again but he still couldn't talk but his eyes started clearing up and he held his he picked his hand up and I thought my sergeant wants me to hold his hand so I kind of crawled up and I grabbed a hold and I still was hoping that he was going to tell me what to do next you know and I grabbed a hold of his hand and I looked down in his eyes. The light bulb that comes on in your head that your daddy always told you about, the light bulb came on. Sergeant Glenn Gant is a black man and I was a white boy from Waverly, Indiana. And I didn't know exactly where it fit in the process of things, but I figured that was one of the reasons why he hated me so bad was because I was a white boy from Southern Indiana and he was a black man from Lansing, Michigan. And that light bulb come on, all these things that he had, you know, polishing the bullet, the beehive round, setting the time fuse on it, setting out in 100 degree heat with a blindfold, passing the beehive round and around and around when we weren't firing. I mean, things that we thought was just picking on us because he was just a mean, bitter old sergeant. 
And all, when I grabbed a hold of his hand, I looked down in his eyes, I knew that he didn't hate me, that he loved me. That instead of going and doing what the other gunnery sergeants did, I mean, they might have had dancing girls and cold beer on the other side of that uh, palm trees over there. I don't know. I was just a private. But Sergeant Gant didn't go do it. He stayed with. He stayed and picked on his kids. He stayed and shared with them the things that he knew was going to help us survive. You know, that was all in that light bulb that came on. And I, you know, I just. And I loved him like my daddy, because that's really what it was. See, you got to love somebody a whole lot to, to pick on them and teach him things. Well, I pulled Sergeant Gant up, not totally out of the water, couldn't get him, couldn't find a spot that didn't, wasn't, didn't have a little bit, but got him up a little bit better, uh, squared him, I gave him a shot of morphine, you know, put a mark on his forehead so when the medic did make it by, you'd know that he had, had already had one shot and made my way back to the other gun crew and helped them until they broke contact about eight in the morning. Uh, started getting dust offs in helicopters about nine o'clock. Uh, Jim Deister was one of the last people that we loaded on the helicopters. He was with our dead. Uh, the medic in the helicopter seen a bubble come up through the chest wound that Jim had in his chest. He'd been shot in the chest also. And took his stethoscope off and put it on his heart and had a heartbeat. And Jim Deister is alive and well today, living in Salina, Kansas. I got to hold Jim Deister's grandbabies. What an awesome feeling, knowing that if I hadn't done my job when I was just a kid, that this precious little thing would not be here. Uh, Billy Ray Crawford survived the war but didn't survive the peace. He went home to Alvin, Texas um, as a black man. Alvin, Texas is below Houston, right on the Gulf. Uh, I went down looking for Billy Ray, and that's when they told me that he had not made it. He tried to medicate himself with alcohol and and drugs and didn't make it. Uh, Billy Ray, or excuse me, uh, Wendell Holloway lives in Stockton, California. Uh, Wendell's doing pretty good. It's been a couple years now since I've talked to him, but I spend a lot of time with Jim Deister because he's close. He, he lives in Salina. Uh, go out and I know his kids as he knows my kids and it's good. There were 11 of us left standing that morning out of the 42 that started, 12 counting me. The other 11 men are the men that put me in for this. When did you find out? I, I didn't do anything heroic. I did my job. That's what soldiers do. And if there was one of these given that night, there should be at least 42 of them. Because if any one of us had not done their job, there would be none of us alive. Where did you dig to find that sort of energy to keep going? My grandpas, my daddy, my brothers, <laughs> mean old Sergeant Gant, you know, just Sergeant Francisco Quinones, you know, he was the one that I didn't know how far I could run. And most people, when you get tired, you quit running. And Francisco Quinones uh, was there kicking my backside and kept me running. And I, wow, I was amazed I could run 20 miles. In fact, I got so good at it, I could run it backwards just like he could. You just you don't lose till you quit trying. No matter what you're faced with, whether it's war or schoolwork or politics, you don't lose till you quit trying. It's, it sounds silly, perhaps, to say that I went to war and found out about love. What real love is? You know, I didn't go to war to kill people. I went to war because I loved my daddy. I wanted him to be proud of me. I went to war because I love my grandpas and I love my country. And when I got over there, the reason why we fought so hard was because we discovered we loved each other, that we were all we had. And they became brothers. We became brothers. And that's lasted up 
you know, it's been 36 years and those men that I fought with are still my brothers. So I, I learned about what real love is. What does the medal mean to you today? What does the Congressional Medal of Honor mean to you? My name's on the back of it, but it doesn't mean it belongs to me. I'm just a caretaker. Everyone that's ever served in our military has a part of this. And I have the privilege of doing a great deal of speaking to our young men and women in the service today, and I'll hand it to them. And they'll say, well, Sergeant, we can't, we can't hold that. I said, no, you have to hold it. Because if you don't feel a part of it, if you don't feel like that's part yours, then it has less value. So there's been over a million hands that's held this. It's the, it's the symbol of love. It's what the Medal of Honor is. And I hope you understand that. You see, because that's what differentiates it between the other awards of valor. If I had done what I had done that night, but I didn't do it to save lives, then I would have received the Distinguished Service Cross or the Silver Star or the Bronze Star. The criteria that makes this different when you awarded the Medal of Honor is that whatever you had to do, you did it to save lives. The Medal of Honor represents love. Can you tell me about the, um, the process immediately afterwards and when you found out that you were going to be nominated for the medal? I uh, spent some time in Japan in a hospital and they told me they were going to send me home. Uh, I told him to get a hold of General Westmoreland that he wouldn't send me home. And sure enough, General Westmoreland interceded on my behalf, allowed me to go back to Vietnam. When I got back to Vietnam, and I was in the hospital for a month or so, when I got back to Vietnam, there, there was talk, you know, that Sammy Davis had been put in for the Medal of Honor. But it was, you know, there's no... I didn't do anything heroic. I'd just done my job, so I didn't think there was any, even a remote possibility that I would ever be awarded the Medal of Honor. When I left Vietnam, uh, they held a, a formation, which was, I think, the only formation I, w that we had in Vietnam. And our battery commander called me out front and said, told everybody that, uh, by then I'd made corporal, he said, Corporal Davis has been put in for the Medal of Honor, and it has cleared the military. It is now in front of Congress. And the way the Medal of Honor works is that in the entire military process and the congressional process, the same thing that changes a bill into a law is how the Medal of Honor is created, that very same process. And if any one person reads the citation and doesn't believe that you earned the Medal of Honor, it's killed, not, you know, and you're awarded the next higher Distinguished Service Cross or the Silver Star. And at that point, it had cleared the military, that all the military had read it and said that, yes, they thought that I had earned the Medal of Honor. So I came back to Fort Hood, Texas, and General Westmoreland put me on the speaking tour, speaking to colleges and universities all over America. And my James O'Day, Kentucky Colonel, uh, Colonel O'Day, kept me posted on where the medal was and what house and the Senate and pretty awesome. And when you finally were awarded the medal, what was, what was the ceremony? How did that? Have you seen the movie Forrest Gump? In the movie Forrest Gump, when the president is putting the Medal of Honor around Forrest's neck, that's really me. They used my footage in the movie Forrest Gump, they just took my face off and put Tom's face there. They based Forrest's citation on my actual citation. I had absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the movie, only the Medal of Honor portion of it. That's amazing. And so, um, so was it was it LBJ? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And 
can you describe the, the ceremony and what it, what it was like for you personally going through it? The most frightening thing I'd been subjected to up till that point in my life. I mean, I'd had good training on how to earn the Medal of Honor. I'd had no training on how to receive it. And I was so frightened standing in front of the president that I thought I was going to fall down. And that's, I was standing up there thinking to myself, please God, don't let me fall down. You know, please don't let me fall down. And I didn't, it worked. Now, I've, I've heard that the actual earning of the medal, now to, to, to a lot of us, it's an awesome thing in itself, but then having the medal can sometimes be an equally awesome kind of burden. It's, how, how, how would you? I wouldn't describe it as a burden to where the Medal of Honor is an obligation. For all the men that earned it, that didn't receive it, it's an obligation. So I've tried to live my life since, I, since this was hung around my neck as I would have believed that you would have if you had earned the Medal of Honor. You know, like I say, my name's on the back of it, but I'm just the caretaker. It doesn't mean it's mine. I'm just the caretaker. You know, to hear you describe how you didn't do anything that heroic. <laughs> I mean, it's. A, I mean, from my perspective, it's heroism just completely beyond. Um, I did my job. That's what soldiers do. Right. I mean, if I had not done my job, they'd have court-martialed me. <laughs> I did my job. That's all I did was, uh, was my job. Everybody's got to work a little over time. Tell me about the decision to go save the three guys. Why? It's my brother. Uh, what immediately came to mind? My little brother. Uh, we've always lived in the country. Uh, when my little brother was big enough to follow me around, follow us around, uh, my older brothers and I, uh, Dad would, uh, he enforced us on us the fact that you don't leave your brother. So when I looked up and seen my brother standing on the other side of the riverbank, it was just instinct. It's what I'd been taught. You don't leave your brother. And I went and got him. I didn't know there was three at that point. I thought there was just Gwendell was standing there. But it, if there had been 20 there, I don't reckon it made much difference. I'd have still done my job. I think there's been more, it seems like, accomplished in terms of brotherhood between the races in the military than anywhere else. Well, that's else. where you find out that the color of your skin or where you're from or you know, doesn't mean any different. It doesn't, it, it's not important. What's important is what's in your heart. And if you're my brother, there's nothing I won't do for you. And that's what you find out. Because when I went into the military, I had my doubts about the normal things that, you know, young kids do, well, because he's a different color or a different religion or whatever. But you find out that, no, nah, you're all brothers. You're all brothers. That's great. Um, let's save it for a second. Um, Kevin. How has the Medal of Honor changed my life? I would like to think that I am the man I am today, whether this was hung around my neck or not. But I truly understand that the man I am today is partly because of this hanging around my neck uh, because I know there's been a lot of times that uh, I had been tempted to uh, do some things that might have brought discredit on someone else that had maybe earned this but not received it. So it's made me be a better person because I've tried to uphold the integrity it's an obligation, I feel, to uphold the integrity of the medal. And that when I'm all done with it, 
the next person that wears it will do the same thing. That's how I received it with the integrity intact and I want it to be intact when I pass it on. Do you, uh, does the, the world of the spiritual enter into this or their belief in God? I mean, in your experience out there, was that part of it or was There it? are no atheists in a foxhole. It's true. I believe in God. I also believe in Buddha and everything else. If, if there's a possibility that one God lives, then there's a possibility that all of them can. And when I was in Vietnam, I didn't want to offend any of them. So I just, the man above. Have you ever been back to Vietnam? No, sir. And I would certainly love to go back, but I will not give the communist my money. I went over there to help the people be free, and they're not free. So I will not go back and give the communists my money. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, very yes, inspiring, sir. and uh, I think uh, we're going to have a wonderful story. Excellent. I need <laughs> one shot of you. Yeah. Like that. Just like that. Do that for a second, and then I'll get a couple of shots of it just on your now, jacket. Talk to me a little bit about the medal while he's doing this shot. Everything on the Medal of Honor is extremely symbolic of our nation. The 13 white stars are representative of the 13 original colonies. The Army Medal of Honor is suspended by the eagle, which is the symbol of the Army. The eagle stands on a bar of valor. The five-pointed star has always had a religious semblance not only in America, but all over the world. Uh, the lady in the, in the middle of the Army Medal of Honor is a lady, Minerva, the Greek goddess of wisdom and war. The green around the outside. There are several, several theories about the green. John Finn uh, related to me what I would like to believe. John Finn told me that the green represents the laurel wreath that Christ wore when he gave his life for those he loved. Yeah. Do you have now we need to see where your name is written on the back. Can you pull it in that close? Yes. You have to hold and then just other angle hand. it a little bit yeah, to your right. There, you go. there we go. And then just turn it a little bit. Well, oh, yeah, that's good. Back. Okay, good, good. Squared away. Thanks, Sam. Oh, take <coughs> <coughs> oh. Wow. Oh, you moved. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, sir. How long did it take to recover from all those? Uh... So far, it's been 37 years. <laughs> Still recovering. Yeah. Yeah. Still recovering. Pleasure, sir. Yes, yes, sir. See you tomorrow. I will. Glad to meet you, sir. Thank you very much. Glad to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Y'all take care. All right, you too. Thank you. Have a good time at the restaurant. It's oh, good food. Turn on the room lights. Good time with your.